Hi there, and thank you for tuning in. Here I have the Godox V860 Mark III made for Nikon. And my intention with this video is to get you going in case you have just bought this flash and you're sitting there looking into the manual and thinking, how does this work? So I will be covering the basics, not everything, just the basics, but I will give you a driver's license to this flash. So let's get started. With the flash comes a little foot or stand. And you simply mount that the same way you would, would do if it was the flash you were mounting on top of the camera. Make sure that it goes all the way in, otherwise you get in all sorts of trouble. And then once it sits, you can lock the position by turning this little thing here. I don't know what to call it. Be aware that there is a button here. So you can hear now it says a cl click sound when I lock it. And then once you need to open it again, you need to push that button in order to open it. Otherwise it's locked and, and you, you, you can't turn it. Uh, so that's a safety mechanism, obviously. That's the way you do it. And uh, mounting it on top of your camera is exactly the same way. As you can see here, this flash is made for Nikon. And uh, that means that this foot here is specific for Nikon. So you can only mount this flash on top of a Nikon camera. If you have triggers that I have here, you can see this, this one is also an Nikon trigger. They had the little end there. But this one here is for Fuji. It has an F as in Frederick. No, I'm kidding. It's F for Fuji, of course. If you just push that one, notice what happens here. You can see it switched from Nikon to Fuji. And that's because now I'm firing the, or triggering the flash with a Fuji trigger. And the, the flash knows this. You can see the protocol knows that it's a Fuji that has triggered it, but it is actually a Nikon flash. And that means that if you have sufficient with triggers, then you actually can use the same flash for different cameras like this. Now I'm back to Nikon, as you can see here. So you can sit here and have a little bit of fun firing between Fuji and Nikon, if that is to your liking. But this is one of the reasons why I really like Godox, because I have many different cameras. I have both Fuji and Sony and Nikon. And uh, I need very few flashes to support that because I have the triggers to go with it. So be aware of that. But the foot here only fits Nikon, even though I can trigger a, a, the, the flash with a, with a Fuji trigger. As you can see here, the hot shoe is made of metal, and so is the foot on the flash. And metal, of course, is a sign of quality. The thing is, though, that I would advise you to be careful when you mount your flash on top of your camera, that you don't bounce the flash into something because the flash is rather heavy and uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the foot here or the, the hot shoe. I have previously had flashes. This is a Sony flash foot that were made of plastic. And uh, I, in the beginning, I thought, hmm, that wasn't very smart. Why, why did they make the foot of plastic? But it is actually quite smart because if you have an accident, then the flash foot here can, can break and you can buy a new one. Uh, as you see here, it's a spare part for a Sony flash. Whereas in this case here, I, I haven't tried it and I don't recommend you try it either. But I would imagine that if something happened, an accident, you drop your camera and it landed on the flash, then it would simply tear the, the hot shoe apart. So be mindful of that. Be careful with your flash when it sits in your hot shoe, because I don't think that any of these two will give. Uh, so one of them is likely to break. So bear that in mind. The battery in the flash sits here and you can push a button here next to the battery and then you can put it out or push it out like this and it comes out like that. And uh, you can see actually there's a hole in the flash now. <laughs> it looks a little bit funny. And if you're in doubt which way to insert it, you can see there are these contacts here and there are contacts, maybe that's difficult to see. Is it better if I do like that? Yeah, you can maybe see the contacts there in the bottom. So now I know these contacts down there, they need to be met by these. So I need to insert it like that. And you just push it and you can hear it starts working. There is a little USB port here. I thought actually in the beginning that that was for charging the battery when it was mounted in the flash, but it's not. I think it's only uh, usable for doing software updates. So you need to use the charger. There's a small charger supplied with the flash. You need to use that for, for charging. You can't do it as far as I can tell uh, using uh, this little port here. By the way, the battery is very, very powerful. And if you have considered buying Mark 1 or Mark 2 of this flash, I would definitely say go with Mark 3. 
because it is a super powerful battery and it recharges super super quickly just just here how quickly it recharges and it's a pleasure to work with and i, I can only say i've had flashes uh, with external battery packs and triple a batteries and whatnot if if your budget allows go for a a, a flash with a, a powerful battery like this one it's an absolute pleasure to work with the flash can obviously send the light straight forward as you see here but it can also used be used for bouncing so that it points upwards and even points a little bit backwards. This is uh, not so often seen with budget-friendly flashes that I consider this one to be. So if you're considering this flash against other flashes, maybe that's one thing to look for if this is important for you, that it can, it can go a little bit backwards when the flash is mounted on the camera. Another thing where I think the Godox is a little bit better than many other off-brand flashes is that the head can turn, as you see here, and it can turn both ways. So your options for bouncing the flash are actually really, really good. The flash comes with a so-called diffuser, built-in diffuser, and uh, it sits right here, and you can hear now the motor starts working. And uh, the diffuser obviously diffuses the light, but it also zooms the head to the widest position. As you can see here, it says now 14 millimeters. And that took me a bit of time to learn because as soon as you pull out this uh, diffuser, you can't change the zoom anymore. So when I listen to what, what happens here, when I push it back in, the motor starts working and it goes back to the position before the diffuser was pulled out. 135 in this case. Of course, it's logical that it goes to the widest position when you when you use the diffuser here, <laughs> but it uh, it really took me a long time to learn. And also, the the thing is, the cursor can actually go up there, so that that was really frustrating for me. I was I did a little bit of rain dance before I uh, found out that this was actually the way it works. So be mindful that if you can't change the zoom, it's probably because the diffuser is out. There also is a little reflector here, and that's useful if you want to send some light forward. If you're bouncing the light upwards, and you want to have some light coming forward because you want to have some cat's light, for instance, then uh, this, this little one can, can do that. These two can work independent of each other, so you can have only the diffuser out, but you can also have the diffuser and the reflector out at the same time. You turn the flash on and off here, and uh, there is a little button that you slide forward, then it switches on. You can test the flash on the green light here, if it's green. If it's red, then it means it's charging. But with this battery, I think you will see that it's more green than red, unless you, of course, fire at full throttle. Uh, but otherwise, you will hardly notice that it changes color, I think. The command wheel here to the right, you have a little light bulb, and that's the modeling light. And that's a new thing with the Mark III. And you can see I can turn the modeling light on and off. And if I just move my hands like that so you can see what's going on, you can see here I turn it on and off like that. And then I can determine the strength of the light. It goes between 1 and 10. That's basically it. One thing to be aware of is, though, that the light points the same direction as the head does when it's pointed forward. But as soon as you bounce or you go backwards or you go sideways, then, of course, the modeling light is, I would say, less useful. But for sure, it's an improvement, and uh, now you know it's there. As you saw with the diffuser, there is a built-in zoom in the flash, so the flash can actually follow the focal length of your camera if you are in automated mode. But you can also set the, the zoom yourself, and it goes between 20 and 200. And you do that by hitting the zoom, button here and you can see the cursor jumps up comes white on black and when it's selected it's black on white right so if i select that one i can now turn and you can hear the motor working i can turn between 20 i think it is and if you go all the way it switches to automated so 20 and all the way up to 200 and then when you have selected your value you just push the button and then it's set the flash has three modes, and here I am in the TTL mode. You can see that's through the lens, that's the automated mode. And you can see that top left here. If I push this button here, you can see it switches now to another mode. This is where the flash now controls other flashes. And uh, a third mode, you can see now the screen turns. Is it red, amber? I don't know. 
but it turns away from blue at least. And you see also it says RX in the middle, and now it is receiving, meaning that this flash is now radio controlled. You can also see that there is a little radio signal top left. There also was that in the, the second screen that I showed you, the second blue one here, this one here. So you know that there's radio in gates when you see the little radio signal uh, top left, but otherwise I would say for now, uh, stay start out with the TTL mode. That's the one that uh, is automated and work with your camera when the, when the flash is mounted on the camera. Here, obviously, the flash is off camera, and uh, you can see this mode here is only available when the, the, when the flash is off the camera. Otherwise, you only have the two blue modes to, uh, to select between. Here in CTL mode, you have exposure compensation. Uh, you can change how powerful the flash is relative to the automated reading. And you can see here, I can add up to three stops of light, or I can take up to three stops of light out. So use that one. You just turn the wheel after you have pushed the plus and minus button, and uh, that's actually it. Once you have found the value that you want, push the center button, and then that is selected. Other than the modes you can select over here, which I will call the main modes, there is a sub mode. So when mounted on camera, you have three options. You have manual mode where you control the strength of the flash. The second menu here is the RPT if you want to fire the flash several times in the same exposure. And back to TTL here where it's automated. My advice to you if you're new to flash photography is use the TTL mode and then use exposure compensation. If you don't get the result that you want to, uh, do that rather than switching to some of the more advanced modes. If you insist and want to go to manual, the logic is a little bit the same as it was with the exposure compensation. You push the plus minus sign and then you can select the strength of the flash. And in general, the, the bigger the number is, here it's 1 and then it goes downwards to 128, I believe. The bigger the number is, the more powerful the, the flash is and more the more taxing it also is for your flash to fire. So now I have selected one 256th and I push the center again to select that and now I can test that uh, value. In terms of the zoom, you can set that also in manual mode like that. And I think that is actually it. The four buttons here on top, their function is determined by what is written in the bottom of the LCD here. So now you can see here it says TCM, sync, and S1 slash S2. That means that as I push this button, for instance, the S1, S2, you can see now it says S1, it says S2, and now it's gone. So that's the way these four buttons in general work. So, so read what it says here in order to figure out what they do. Sync is high-speed synchronization. That is if you're going above your your camera's uh, synchronization speed for the flash. Uh, I will not cover that in detail, but, but just know that that's what it does. And uh, the other here, that is perhaps more useful for, for manual shooting, is one is that the flash is able to be in optical slave mode. Now that means that there is a little uh, reader sitting here, I believe, that can see if another flash is firing. And that, that can be useful if you have a camera with a built-in flash. So if your camera has a built-in flash like uh, my Nikon D750 here has, then you can, you can obviously uh, use that. That one can then optically trigger the Godox over here. And what S1 and S1, S2 means is now the optical slave function is turned off. Now it will react to the first light it sees, and now it will react to the second light it sees. And that is because when you're shooting in CTL mode over here on the camera, the camera will pre-fire, if I can call it like that, a flash to measure the light, and then second time it will fire the real flash, so to speak. And this one is two simply tells the optical trigger to ignore the first flash and then react on the second. So here it is, optical slave off, optical slave will react to the first flash, optical slave will react to the second flash. And this is quite nice, even though you have to set up the flash manually, I think this is quite nice because you can get your flash off camera, provided you have a camera with built-in flash, uh, without having a trigger. So I'm really happy to see that Godox chose to include the optical slave in, in their flash here. Not many do, uh, but they do it. And uh, I think that is, that's a great option to have. 
Finally, I want to mention the menu button here. If you push that one, you get into a very long menu system with lots of options that I will not talk about because then this video would be even more boring than it probably already is. But know that it's there and in here you can, for instance, change between feet and meter and you can also turn the sound on and off. But I don't want to do any of that today, so I just leave it again. If I long hold this same button, you can see now here in the button it says locked. And uh, the, this can be useful if you don't want anyone to tamper with your set settings when you're out and about shooting. And you can long hold that again to unlock it. You can see now it's back to, to where it was before. That was the end of it. I hope this was useful. As always, happy shooting. Take care. Bye-bye.